Good morning and welcome everyone to today's webinar on how Shopstop secures its online stores. We have Venkatesh Sundar, or Venki as he is like to be called, Chief Technology Officer at Industries, Gopakumar Panikar, General Manager IT and CISO at Shopstop, and Shantanu Dutt, Solutions Architect at Amazon Web Services. Before we start, a couple of housekeeping items. You will notice we are using the GoToWebinar viewer today. If you look at your control panel, the little orange panel will let you expand and hide that. This is where you can choose on how to listen to us today, either via microphone or speaker or the telephone. You will all have joined us in listen only mode. That means you're muted to cut back on the background noise. But that doesn't mean we don't want to hear from you. Feel free to chat with us and drop any questions via the Q&A or chat window and we will address them during the Q&A session of the webinar. The webinar recording will be sent to all the webinar participants post the event. My name is Nikhil Dessa and I'm here with you from the team at Indusface and I'm here to help monitor the questions during the Q&A. With that said, I'm going to hand it over to Wenki here and he can go ahead and get started with the presentation today. Take it away, Vinky. So thanks, thanks for the introduction and handoff, Nikhil. And uh, thanks for all the participants. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, uh, do this webinar and uh, showcase a use case of what uh, we are saying actually being used by a customer in AWS. So uh, uh, let, to, a quick introduction. What we're going to talk about is uh, application security. Uh, uh, where specifically where customers who are uh, central to their business is their applications and most of the customers are having high aspirations they're running at 150 miles an hour they are trying to grow their business and mobile application and web applications is central to their business uh, security is always a big concern and it's a barrier for the speed at which they want to run and grow their business most of the customers we talk to uh, acknowledge the fact it's a big concern, but they don't know what to do, how to do it, how to monitor it. And they feel it's a big pain point that is coming in the way of how quickly they would like to build and grow their business. And that's where we come in as a total application security vendor. And the use cases that we tell them is in layer seven, what we go, go, go and tell the customers, uh, and Shopper Stop is one example that is actually putting it to use, which we'll hear about later, is uh, uh, for application security, the number, because it's continuously changing, you have to always be on top of what is my current risk? What is my biggest vulnerabilities? Are there any vulnerabilities that exist in the application? What is my current threat and security posture? That use case is what we call as detect. Next step is, okay, fine, I know my risk. Risks can be known risk, which is vulnerabilities. There can be generic threats, which is like application data, and other kinds of new attack vectors that keeps coming up and you keep hearing about it. The second use case that uh, business owner gets worried about is, okay, fine, I know my security posture, I know my risk. How do I protect myself against it? So that's what we call as protect. And it's not a cookie cutter solution where we configure it on day one and forget about it and thinking that you are protected, right? Because applications are changing. Uh, the attack vectors on the search landscape is continuously changing. So you have to also continuously monitor it. And with monitor, you again go back and improve your policies and detect and protect use cases. So the third use case is how do I keep continuously keep my monitor it and keep myself updated uh, to make sure that I'm secure and keep running my business. So that is what we call as total application security, detect, protect, monitor, one-stop shop to fix all the security issues, right? So trying to remove the technology, technical mumbo jumbo of web application firewalls, which of course is the technical term, uh, pen testing, scanning, and all these are technical terms that we'll be talking about. But fundamentally as a business owner with applications being the central point of the business, Detect, protect, and monitor is a use case that we believe a lot of customers will make with. Right. So before I get into the detail, I mean, there are some lot of literatures that we have around this concept, uh, which you can go to our website, and we have blogs which talk about how much time it takes for a customer to identify a vulnerability, fix the vulnerability, 
uh, uh, lot of you, uh, what, what are some of the top threat vectors? All these are found in our research blog. I'm not going to go into the details. These are things you can go ahead and download white papers and blogs from our website. I'm going to double click on each of the three use cases and talk a little bit more about it before I hand it off to uh, Shopper Shop. Go past. So what are the detection challenges, right? So in the web and mobile world, right, web applications, obviously, I don't have to preach uh, again and again. It, it's central to any business. Like even if you have an offline business, the online part is going to be an extension to the offline business, either for brand building or another point of sale system if it's an e-commerce site or other thing, right? So applications, no matter what your business is, is critical to the business nowadays. Right? You can, I cannot think of any serious business without an online presence or without an online application that is part of their business presence. Right? Uh, the applications are becoming increasingly complex. It's not like in the traditional desktop days like 20 years back, uh, you have a standalone application. Applications are complex. They run on a third party infrastructure. They run on a third party application server. They run on, they interact with service oriented with other third party systems like payment gateway. And one of the cliches of security is your defense is only as strong as your weakest point, right? And each one of these moving parts are continuously changing. So they are becoming very complex. And with complexity comes the challenge of understanding what is it I do about security and how do I keep them updated, especially with the increasing threats, increasing changes in regulations and IT landscape, right? So and, and any of these moving parts has a vulnerability. Going back to the statement, it is only as strong as your weakest link. Any vulnerability in any of these moving parts can lead to a complete breach, right? Uh, and, and can impact the business, the brand, customer confidence, and, and, and so on and so forth, right? And, and, and if you look at what is, what is constituting an application, it, it's basically based on whatever service the customer is offering. There is a business logic and flow. And sometimes some of the most common vulnerabilities and threats are not really on specific attack vectors, but actually exploiting a business logic. So you also have to continuously keep ensuring that the business logic flaws and everything are not creating. Uh, it, it might be tougher to find, but it can have far greater ramifications. Right? So it's something that gives a lot of sleepless nights. Uh, so in terms of detection, uh, the challenges are the continuous changing landscape. No application is an island and trying to be on top of <coughs> what is my security risk at the tip of the finger on a continuous basis. That is one of the biggest challenges. How do we, how do we address this challenge? So we, it has to be a two-pronged approach. Some of the basic things has to be done periodically and continuously without having to, and, and, and quickly as well. So it's an automated scanner. Some of the common vulnerabilities, common attack vectors, new attack vectors which can be automated. We should allow the customer to do an on-demand scanning and testing and get a snapshot of what the current posture is continuously at any time from wherever they want, right? I also mentioned one of the challenges, business logic flaws. Business logic flaws is very tough to automate and do it continuously, right? So you had to combine this automated scanning with something called as manual penetration testing, which has a human touch, which understands the application, understands the flow, goes through it, takes a combination of all the automated tools and its findings and combines it with manual penetration testers and human brains to try to figure out what are all potential business logic flaws that can have, that can be exploited. See, if you think about it, a hacker is also doing potentially the same thing. They are not just randomly going out and uh, trying to do attacks, right? They are also trying to find vulnerabilities. They are also trying to find flaws. And the difference is they try to exploit, whereas mental strikers, we try to report, protect, and monitor. Right? So it has to be a comprehension application, comprehensive testing that has to be done in depth, frequently, and has to be done with the help of the experts. Right? Uh, because the, 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 the business owners, they want to run with their business and their application. Security testing is a specialized skill. Right? So now with detection, you understand, okay, fine, I know what my problems are, but how do I protect it? What are the most easiest thing to protect, and I will never ever take away that part of the preach. We are not going to give protection as a replacement to you fixing in your application. Whatever is the issues identified and I travel has to be protected whenever possible in the application by fixing the core or fixing the whatever flaws has been identified. 
but it may not always be possible right detection just gives you a magnifying your risk and what are the uh, problem but it does not prevent attack you have to take steps to prevent the attack but even if the intent exists to prevent them or fix them it may not always be possible because uh, of third party applications and dependencies on many third party components so uh, i'm just going to lay down the landscape of how a typical application uh, deployment looks like right most most of the people i have network firewalls and ideas and ips and ip based rules but http by http and https which is a protocol for applications by definition and by design is meant for the world and for public use and it is open right and it is in in a perfect world legitimate users will come in but it also leaves open room for an attacker to come in 75% of the attacks happen at an application layer and going to my point that even if we have an intent to fix it our finding based on our 4 plus years of experience scanning and doing manual pen testing on an average it takes 100 plus days for a customer from the point of doing an issue to fix it it takes 100 days and there is nothing worse than knowing about a risk and not being able to fix it right besides this vulnerabilities application layer ddos is becoming a big today right it it it's something where uh, without too much computing power like network ddos and volumetric attacks by design is you you do a distributed volumetric attack application ddos does not require human gas computing power you can you can really exploit application vulnerabilities to bring down a system or you can do an application layer denial of service with very minimal computing power without having to do volumetric attack and that can also which is a very big threat in terms of business continuity so the key point i want to mention from this slide is even if you want to fix it it may not always be possible but having said that you should still try to fix it uh but the time to fix is where our protection layer is one area of benefit that we give but that alone is not the benefit i'll talk about it a little bit later uh but to fix it in a layer outside of the application requires expert tuning it requires continuous monitoring it is not something that an application owner can take a box configure it and have it it has to be managed and continuously tuned so 451 and gartner uh, echo that point of view where expert tuning can be the difference between a working defense layer and an application layer uh, or a piece of uh, iron or uh, dabba i would say gathering dust gartner says that at least the application layer technology back has to be offered as a service security as a service because it's specialized skills it requires continuous monitoring this is my favorite slide so if you look at the industry like people are talking about web application firewall we talk about application security then people are talking about next generation firewall which in my view is not really next generation this is a term that exists in the industry next generation is just bundling in some basic firewall web application capability into a load balancer or an adc right you need specialized layer 7 security so a specialized web application firewall is what we believe can provide the best comprehensive defense and continuously managed by you that's what we believe should be a true next generation firewall and specialized best in breed web application firewall today is way better from a security standpoint than the existing what so called next generation firewall that is being marketed in the industry right because all they do is you have a point in point in your route throw in a bunch of regex and boom you say you have a next generation firewall regex is i mean anybody can come up with a web application firewall as a technology throw in a bunch of regex i throw in a bunch of rules and i uh, what i mean it's it's not going to be effective who is monitoring them who is updating them how do we make sure that it is done with exceptions and uh, targeted surgically accurate patch without any false positive it is something that requires continuous manage management and requires specialized expertise right and that is where web application firewall as a best of breed makes sense and in fact i will go and not above and say that as a business owner you don't even want to talk about firewalls you just say i want application security and these are what i care about and web application firewall is the underlying technical module that different vendors can choose to help solve the customer problem right <clears throat> and of course uh, compliance is one of the key drivers but i personally believe security has to be a driver and compliance has to be the side effect right 
that's an utopian world. Sometimes compliance can be the driver to get people who are not so focused on security to also get some basic level of security because of the compliance thing. So it, both of them is needed for the industry to at least protect their business. Now, I'm going to pause here for a second. The monitor aspect is one of the most important. I talked about detect knowing your vulnerabilities. Then I talked about protect, uh, which will reduce the time to fix. But I also mentioned that the time to fix is not only benefit. It is just one benefit, right? I mean, if you can fix it in the application, you should still go ahead and fix it in the application. But I would still say that in spite of you fixing in the application, having a policy in a layer is still needed in spite of it fixing in the application. And this is where it's going to be a good segue into monitor. The reason being, I'm going to talk about a very simple use case here. I have a vulnerability, let's say, no server-side validation enforced, right? Uh, it's a very common vulnerability, and I'll explain what it means. Uh, I fill in a form, I type in a mobile number, and I hit submit, and the server takes the mobile number and stores it in the database. There is a validation logic that says that mobile number has to be 10 characters and 10, law, 10 characters law, no uh, alphabet. Most likely, this uh, validation will be enforced on the client side through JavaScript or some other uh, client side logic, and submit, and the server just stores it. An attacker can bypass this client side validation because he will put a bur proxy or something and bypass this validation and store and put some junk characters and mobile numbers. The customer might say, you know what, I can fix it and do the server side validation, or he might say, you know what, I don't think it's a serious vulnerability. At maximum, I'm going to get Google Dbook characters in my database. That's fine. It's not a big risk. But imagine if I'm creating a custom rule and a policy for this. When this policy gets hit, when this policy gets hit in the application security VAS layer, it's a trigger that I am dealing with an attacker on the other side. It's a guaranteed bad user on the other side. And that's where monitoring comes in. It's not just a piece of regex that and gives you protection against the payload, but that regex or that policy has got intelligence built in. Based on every policy hit, you can improve your protection layer dynamically through anomaly scoring, machine learning, and all those things, and human intervention as well. So the monitoring is a key aspect based on which, based on continuous policy, and that's what we talk about in tweaking, that it provides you an in-depth data to identify and mitigate attacks. It allows you to prompt, there is going to be no silver bullet for application layer denial of service. It is going to allow you to prompt for those cells and come up with a policy to prevent against them. Right? It is a real-time incident monitoring and learning with a human touch that can allow you to tweak it on a continuous basis and allows the business owner to talk to a person, please explain to me. You have shown me this vulnerability, explain to me. You have done this policy, explain to me. Or the policy can be updated through those learning and continuously it helps build your defense posture. This is the most important aspect and one of the most key differentiators because having uh, a policy that will uh, have some rejects and put some blocks is an extremely simple thing to do, right? And I believe any serious person who talks about application security has to look at all three aspects with the human touch for somebody managing it as one of the key aspects of doing the uh, maintaining the business continuity, right? So we call this the monitoring becomes the foundation and the basis for learning with analytics with the human touch and with machine learning and anomaly scoring and risk profiling and all those things coming up, it becomes extremely powerful, right? So that's my uh, view on this. I think it will be much more effective to take this and actually see this in use with the customers because I believe the best kind of preach is not talking on PowerPoint, but actually having somebody who has been there, done it, and executed it in a live business talking about it. That's where the learning happens the most. So with that, I would like to pass it on to uh, uh, Gopa. So thanks, Vankatesh. Some dose of uh, security early morning. I often wonder. You're, you know, you're welcome. Uh, <laughs> I often wonder uh, in information security, is it to scare people and be scared also, you know, right, at times? We do that. 
internally also we do that, you know, scare people and also be scared about things. Um, so, uh, um, thank you for all of you joining the webinar. Uh, I'm from Shopstop. Uh, I'm working for Shopstop for quite some time now. Um, uh, uh, Shopstop uh, is a uh, department store chain. Primarily, we are spread across uh, 36 cities in India. We operate in different retail formats. Um, some of the brands uh, you may be aware: Shopstop, Homestop. Um, Hypercity, Crossword. We also operate in airports. Some of the airports uh, we do operate. Um, we also have a cosmetic uh, association with uh, the Estee Lauder Group. So some of the cosmetic brands uh, like MAC, Clinic, we operate in India. Uh, we also have a presence online, shopstar.com, uh, though uh, it is not very aggressive, uh, active uh, um, at this point. The reason behind that is the prevailing market conditions. But slowly we are uh, building our online presence, but it is not a uh, marketplace or, or, or very ag aggressive discounting based approach. Um, whereas most of the uh, players out there is a discounting based approach or um, get customers uh, uh, through discounting. So our approach has been to provide uh, experience for our customers. Uh, around around 70% uh, of our sales come from our uh, first citizens, which is our registered loyal customers. So our objective has been to target them uh, and then provide them um, a seamless experience through omnichannel uh, platform. So, which means that uh, wherever you go, whether it is Shopstop, Hypercity, Crossword, when there is one single customer identity, um, we have complete visibility of inventory, order history. Um, we can sell through multiple channels such as mobile, web, TV, chaos, stores, multiple payment options, um, anything can be sold anywhere. So, and that's been our uh, objective uh, for the last uh, two years and uh, slowly we are building the ecosystem uh, uh, for omni-channel journey. So when we talk about omni-channel, um, if some of you may not be aware about the term, it is means that um, combining the experience of offline and online for convenience, uh, such as you can uh, order online, pick up in a store, or you can, as we can assist customers uh, shopping in the store. If there is a product not available in the store, it can be um, sent through our online platform. You can buy online and exchange in store, or uh, we can ex ship uh, the product immediately, quickly, faster than the um, online guys, since uh, some of our stores may be near the customer uh, places, uh, or we can also offer international delivery programs. So, you know, some of these things are part of our omni-channel uh, platform and uh, plans we have. Some of these six things uh, we already have, and uh, some of the things are in progress at this point. Um, if you look at uh, Shopstop, uh, we are building the omni-channel platform. Uh, for our internal and external brands and business units. Um, if, and also, uh, for most of the brick and mortar retailers, uh, the online infrastructure has been a challenge uh, because uh, the existing systems they had is, was all about traditional uh, retailing. And not were not ready for retail integration, real-time inventory, um, Agile development, those kind of things. So we had to change our approach completely to move to an agile-based development approach, which means we have continuous releases. Every two weeks there is a release. It's good for the business. It's good for the development team, but it puts a lot of stress on the security teams because you really don't have time to test it um, and trash out all the vulnerabilities and then release. So uh, the, the whole process has to be integrated along with the development process and 
within the development cycle itself, you have to consider your security assessments, uh, mitigations, uh, and and combine with the release cycle. So we don't typically get two week, three week window for testing and then release. Um, so at this point, if you look at um, uh, a lot of our effort is towards information security and securing the apps. Uh, one of the key reasons behind that is we have over 5 uh, million registered active regular customers who come to our uh, store and the data related to them is very critical to us. Um, so uh, we've been, um, we focus a lot on um, information security. As a company we are PCDS certified. Um, we are also moving towards certifying our online infrastructure on PC devices. Um, so if you look at uh, some of the uh, threats uh, we face is that um, we see a lot of bots uh, um, coming to gather information. Um, there are good bots and bad bots. And, uh, good bots are welcome, but a lot of bad bots create uh, havoc on the site, they slow down the site, take information unnecessarily. Um, and, and it becomes a nightmare to manage. And whereas other things are like people are target on uh, payment pages. Sometimes also you see that people try to hijack the entire site or specific things like order management systems. You know, the moment you hijack it, um, there is a ransom situation um, to go through that is a painful experience. Um, if you look at our uh, online store, um, uh, we've been working on it for the last uh, uh, two years. Uh, it is, uh, two years back, we were hosting it in premise, um, uh, our own servers, uh, everything right from WAF to firewalls to servers, the virtualization platform, everything. Um, uh, last 16 months, we are now on AWS. Um, the reason behind moving to AWS specifically was to create a very agile infrastructure. So uh, something like, you know, we can uh, create VMs or acquire services quickly, much more granular controls. We no longer have to struggle to get services. For example, we want to get a CDN, we want to get a caching service, or we want to get uh, a WAF or we want to get a, um, something like a file integrity monitor. Everything is available there as a service in the marketplace. So no longer we have to struggle to evaluate things and uh, install it, run it. So AWS gives that ability to quickly get those applications and services and then uh, start do using immediately. Also, what happens in an in online uh, infrastructure is that uh, you have constant uh, requests coming from uh, the developers to create and dismantle infrastructure. Uh, as we speak, uh, there is an upgrade process going on for the uh, platform. So they wanted, uh, uh, they were going through this testing and uh, UAT cycle and they wanted a different infrastructure to tested because the existing one was not able to meet the production, uh, existing production and any. So uh, those requests come quickly, you know, you don't really don't have time to execute um, in a physical world. So in AWS, we're able to do in a matter of uh, minutes, you know, in 30 minutes flat, we are able to give them that infrastructure, uh, including all uh, associated services such as you have load balancers, or and everything protected. So those kind of agility we are getting from AWS. So right from the beginning, we have we will be using uh, uh, WAF from Interspace. So we have uh, both WAF and continuous scanning services. Uh, it really helps to um, combine these two because uh, since we have a very shorter um, cycle for uh, release, uh, it is important to scan the infrastructure and then whatever vulnerabilities you detect, you can protect through WAF automatically or manually. So, which is a great advantage because sometimes, you know, you don't have really time to fix these issues. So, if you have a mitigation step and you know that, okay, I have some time to, to provide the developers to issue a 
patch. Um, so uh, in this approach, what happens is uh, we have a complete visibility that what all vulnerabilities exist, how the WAF is protecting, creation of custom rules uh, in case something we can't fix it. So overall, um, this combined approach along with uh, monitoring, continuous monitoring by the industry, it's a, it's a good uh, platform that way. Um, otherwise, what happens is you install a WAF, uh, locally, you will struggle to create the rules, manage them, and other, and also to uh, monitor them. We already integrated with the sim, um, and the guys who manage the sim typically not all of them understand an online business and attack um, um, of online attacks, and there's a huge differentiation between layer seven and other type of attacks. So traditional sim approaches are all towards network based, and so. Uh, for us to even train them and then um, focus on uh, online threats, it's a problem. So this approach of that managed WAF is, a, is also a great advantage for us in that. Um, as I spoke, uh, we face a lot of uh, uh, right from bots to DOS uh, attacks on our site and uh, industry's been there with us. Uh, uh, right from the beginning, uh, we handle uh, both the uh, WAF part and uh, application assessment. As we speak, we are working towards uh, uh, getting the infrastructure certified for PCA DSS. All right. Uh, Nikhil, can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay. I'll get started then. Uh, good morning, folks, again. This is Shantanu Dutt from Amazon Web Services. Uh, Gopa, thanks for that insightful presentation. Uh, needless to say that I am personally a ShopperStop customer. Uh, why am my wife, though? And I have, you know, have had my wallet burnt a couple of times because she loves ShopperStop. But we'll take that another time. Today, we'll talk about AWS security. And what I'll really go through in the next 10 minutes is, you know, uh, just what you have done in terms of the security uh, features and subset and why our customers are using us. The one question that we asked customers, if you've been a cloud computing provider for the last 10 and a half years, and one thing that we asked customers in the last four to five years is, and especially enterprise customers, large enterprise customers, as to what's driving them to adopt AWS. And what we found out initially was a little surprising. Uh, it it was not really cost, it was really agility, innovation, and the third piece was security, one market year over year. And so clearly, it's kind of, uh, it, it really gave us the confidence that customers are telling us that security is one of the reasons as to why they want to adopt AWS. And obviously, security has always been our number one priority always. We believe in building security right from grounds up. Uh, having a familiar security model and ensuring that all security features that go into the platform are applicable to all the 1 million plus customers that we have on this planet. Uh, there is no such thing as security applied to a specific customer. Every security feature is ap applicable to every customer. Uh, we started to kind of do certifications and accreditation several years ago because we figured that just us telling the world that we are secure doesn't help. So obviously we went through the industry standard certifications from PCI DSS compliance to ISO 27001 to SOC 1, SOC 2, SOC 3 compliance to FRISMA and so on and so forth. And these are actually audited by external auditors. And if you as a customer need a copy of it or if your auditor needs a copy of it, it's simple. You get in an NDA with us and then we send you a copy of that latest report of that certification that you're asking directly to that inbox. Now. One thing that needs to be remembered in the cloud world in general, and this is where some novice customers when they're new to the cloud get it wrong, is security is still a shared responsibility, right? There are some parts of security on the cloud that a customer is still responsible for. So those things don't change. Fortunately, it just so happens that a large part of it is managed by us, and you have to do smaller portions of it versus what you would do in an on-premise data center. So for example, anything that is hypervisor level and above, that is operating system level and above, is a customer's responsibility. But anything that is below that hypervisor level from the actual physical host, hosting a virtual machine to networking equipment to the data center to racks and physical security is all the responsibility of the cloud computing provider, in this case, Amazon Web Services. 
and obviously I don't have enough time to go through all the integrities of security aspects. I can probably talk about it for a day long session and I'll give you links to kind of go through offline on our website. But let's talk about a couple of things. One is the physical security of a data center. This is extremely strictly controlled. We are housed in non-district facilities. We have obviously data centers across 13 different geographical regions across the world, including the latest one in Mumbai, which we opened about a couple of months ago, June 28th to be precise. And similarly, we have 12 to 13, 13 other geographical regions across the world where we have such data centers. And these are typically housed in non-descript facilities with very, very robust perimeter controls. We have two-factor authentication for most employees visiting the data center who need access to the data center. Most other AWS employees, including me, who don't need to visit the data center are basically unaware of even the physical address of where the data center is because we don't need to know. And so we don't disclose data center addresses. We have clear separation of duties in terms of logical and physical access to the data center. Uh, employees are actually vetted against uh, controls and there are background checks done. And every 60 to 90 days, their ID card, their access is checked for. So if an employee does not need access to data center anymore, that is revoked immediately. And then within that, there are various perimeter controls as well. So we obviously are a multi-tenanted provider. So it's a cloud computing platform. And so multiple customers will end up sharing a common physical host, each one of them with their own virtual machine. And so in there, there is a specific physical firewall such that the virtual machine operates at something called as ring three, whereas the base hypervisor operates at ring zero. And so access between customers and hacking into each other's VM is almost impossible. In fact, impossible, it's never happened. And what customers typically do is if they have to communicate with another virtual machine belonging to another customer on the same physical host, the communication still goes all the way to the physical interface through the firewall and comes back to that same virtual machine. And so it's as good as two virtual machines operating on different physical boxes. Uh, things like multicast, anycast, etc., are completely blocked. And spoofing and you know source IP changing, etc., is not allowed and not possible. On the storage side, we in fact don't take any chances. There's a famous saying we have at Amazon that no physical device or physical disk leaves the Amazon data center intact. And so after a disk reaches end of life uh, and a customer releases it from their account, we actually, apart from you know formatting it at a low level, uh, erasing all the data, do complete degaussing and physically shred the hard disks like it's shown in this picture. So it's actually put through a shredder and only then does it leave our data center. We take no chances. Uh, the kind of last part of my presentation is I'll kind of end with this and go through what each one of these means, right? Uh, and I've gone through multiple customers through this and they find it extremely insightful. Security is a very, very broad topic. It's an ocean. And so in a way to objectify it, if you were to find out how secure your own data center is or your own deployments in the cloud data center is in a cloud computing platform like Amazon or even otherwise, the generally to objectify it, there are three questions you could ask yourself. How visible is your entire set of resources that you're running? How auditable it is and how much control do you have? Now in terms of visibility, we believe that the AWS platform gives you more visibility because think about this. Can you actually, I ask this question to customers, can you actually map your entire network, that is all your servers, all your softwares, all your tools, and all your networking equ equipment that you're running in your data center or series of data centers in an easy manner? Because you can only secure what you can see and what you have access to. And almost the answer almost always is no, because it's always diversified. And so if let's say you have multiple data centers across multiple geographies, there is this one single console and one single control plane that you have to actually access all of them. And so what you have with this UI at AWS is with just clicks of a mouse or just drop down windows, you can have access to every single resource that you ever run on AWS, no matter how large it is or how diversified it is across the five different continents that we have data centers in. The other piece is there are various tools in place which are included. If you are, let's say, a support customer, there is something called a trusted advisor where if you actually click a button, it actually in real time scans your entire set of resources that you're running on the cloud and proactively gives you recommendations secure or unsecure you are or how, let's say, cost unoptimized you are. So you could be running large virtual machines, uh, 
which are not optimized or you could be keeping your firewall ports open to the world accidentally, it will actually raise a red flag. And so it's pretty intuitive in that sense, so saves a lot of operational cycles. In terms of auditability, I won't speak too much about this because we already covered this, wherein we had all these comprehensive certifications in place. We've had at least two or three large customers, including the FSI space and NASA here, who have said that because it's so expensive to keep and maintain security on-premise, there are cases where we have found that the AWS data center or the AWS cloud is actually more secure than our own data center. And so that's a statement we take very seriously and we obviously can't continue to maintain highest standards on our security over the years. Uh, in terms of auditability, again, we give you various tools. This one actually is called CloudTrail, which is really uh, comes, to, at, comes to you at no cost at all. It's actually included in the account. What you can basically do is click a button and enable this. And what it basically does is logs every single API request that you make to your resources. So if you've spun up a new server, you've shut it down, you've opened a firewall port, etc., etc., without really using or spending on an extra tool, you basically have a table where everything is logged against a timestamp and a username. Uh, in terms of control, it's actually a myth uh, that most people think, when, especially when they're novices to the cloud, that your data is anywhere on the internet. That's not true. You basically control where your data is. So when you create an AWS account, you choose which region or which country or which city you want to have choose the AWS region and then upload your data and start off resources like servers, databases, application servers, hard disk, and so on and so forth. And so you basically choose and control where your data stays. Amazon does not have any access to your data. This is actually audited. And we do not touch your data at all because we don't have access to it. It's for you to decide where you keep your data. And you choose the continent and country with the drop-down windows. Uh, there are tools like identity and access management, which is very powerful. I give this example to some customers where using this tool, you can actually create a simple policy where you can state that a user x, if coming from a particular IP address at a particular time of a day from a particular machine can only access so-and-so resources if he meets all that criteria. And you can actually create this rule with a few clicks of a check or check marking a few boxes without doing anything else. Now is this easy to do on-premise? Is it possible to do on-premise? Sure. But it will require extreme level of operational uh, excellence, a lot of investment in tools uh, and additional investments to actually make this in play. And so this is kind of given to you, again, included um, in the account itself for you to kind of enable yourself to go over. We obviously have encryption as well. Uh, this is at the infrastructure layer. So for example, encryption is something that doesn't change, comes back to the shared security model. It doesn't really change in the cloud. Some of the security policies stay similar. At the infra level, at services that we provide, we have native encryption in place if you want to use that or you can use your own crease. So you can just check mark a simple box and have encrypted data on your volumes or your hard disks. If you want further encryption at the application level, then that's where the other terms of in our partners like Interface come in to kind of build on top of that layer as well. And you've heard from Interface and Shopstop as to how they kind of build on that. Uh, we released about two years ago something called Cloud HSM. Uh, some of the financial services firms and banks actually need this. This is actually a physical device. And so we actually give this in a pay per use model as well to actually manage your keys. And so that's it for me. Uh, this was quick because I had 10 minutes because we wanted to ensure that we give you enough time for Q&A. If you actually want more information, more than happy to answer your questions. Uh, you can reach to me offline after this webinar. Happy to answer questions immediately after this as well. If you go to aws.amazon.com slash security, you will find a ton of information of what I have just mentioned and much more through our white papers where we have extreme detailed information as to what uh, security processes we undertake on our services on our platform and inside our data center physically. That's it from me for now. Over to you guys uh, in the space team. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you guys. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Venki, uh, Gopa, and uh, Shantanu for your very insightful uh, knowledge. Uh, I will just switch on to my. Uh, just quickly switch on. So we'll just go to a quick, uh, you know, Q and A, uh, Q &A session here. So uh, I've got some very interesting uh, uh, questions uh, lined up and uh, I've got a very good few questions asked by the audience here. So let me 
put the first question here to the uh, you know from the audience here to uh, Venki. So Venki, this is a question uh, that I got here, which uh, asks that you know there are various categories of security products covering infrastructure to application layers, and there are many security solutions for it. What are the important criteria, parameters to select the right solution? Okay. Uh, yeah, it's a very broad question. It's also an interesting question. I can talk about application security uh, because that's what I do for a living and that's where we believe uh, we have a unique value proposition to offer uh, different than what others are doing in this space. Uh, rightly, as the person rightly pointed out, security has got uh, aspects that covers infrastructure, network, access control, uh, everything. Right? We come in specific to your application layer. Your application is doing a set of things. It has got a set of functionalities that is needed for your business. Vulnerabilities in those applications, business logic flaws, uh, data validation flaws, and uh, attacks, and application DDoS can put those into this. We take only that aspect and provide a complete end-to-end -end management from scanning your applications to doing a manual penetration testing to immediately protecting them with policies and not just stopping there, learning from what are all the policy hits that are happening and the policy is not static but actually dynamically changing its behavior based on who is on the other side through a combination of manual and automated logic in it. That's the laser sharp focus and in fact I believe given that 75% of the attacks are happening as an application layer and the bang for the buck for the attacker with respect to creating fraud is a lot higher at an application layer. It's much more important to, for I believe customers to spend their time on application layer. Right, right now, 75% the investment is quite the reverse. A lot of investment on the network layer uh, and, and a cookie cutter solution might be possible at a network layer, but certainly not possible at an application layer because we need to be Hope that answers the question. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I also got another question. This uh, question is for Gopa. So one of the uh, attendees had this question as to: Did you do any sort of comparison with uh, you know the likes of or uh, you know, like likes of Azure or any other cloud providers before you know going uh, along with the vendors? Uh, sure. Uh, am I audible now? Yes. Yes, you are audible. Yeah, we have done. Uh, actually, this is uh, not a uh, session for comparing them, but I still answer a bit. Uh, we did that. Um, uh, AWS and there is others, very many others in India and others also. Uh, like example, uh, we have um, IBM Software, we have Azure, and many of the Indian service providers also. Present. But uh, what happened is that when we compared, we compared physical because we have a very uh, well managed uh, virtual infrastructure in house. So, as for the last uh, 15 years, we've been virtualizing right from uh, different uh, virtualization platforms such as uh, IBM Power VM to uh, Hyper V to VMware, so to different, different, for different purposes. Some, for some purposes, we use Docker also. So, but the key thing is that you know when you go to all these um, in, a, in in the in premise infrastructure, the time taken to do things is high. And the differentiator in the platforms like Azure or Software Amazon is the ability to granularize and quickly uh, uh, get the resources or uh, services you want. When we compared, uh, we felt that uh, AWS has an edge there. Uh, it's um, two years back. Uh, at that point, AWS did have a clear edge over others uh, because the number of services available, ability to granularize, the security aspect, uh, which Shantanu just mentioned, right, the granular part of it, which basically is is helping us in terms of uh, uh, PCI DSS compliance. For example, uh, when we are going for PCI DSS compliance. Straight away, since the underlying infrastructure is certified and you get a compliance package from uh, AWS, 
So it's very easy to handle that part. You know, you just think that you know, have to focus only on your application part. So uh, whereas in uh, traditional in PCDS, the infrastructure is a grow a lot of work. 60, 70 percent of your time spent in PCDS certification is infrastructure work. Um, whereas here in AWS, since it is certified, already certified, and your job is easy. So those were the primary parameters uh, when we compared multiple options. Okay, thanks, thanks, Gopa. Uh, I have one more question for Venki. Uh, this time around, the question is: uh, One of the audiences wanted to know if he can get some sort of insights uh, into the analytical-based rule rule policies uh, that were implemented uh, into the back in terms. So that was a question that was asked by the audience. Yeah, sure. sure. I think. Uh, uh, it's 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 an ocean. I think with machine learning coming in place, the possibilities of self-learning and having policies dynamically updating themselves or changing. I mean, it's not a simple regex that applies to all. The regex it it, it can have its own logic, which can change or change based on uh, the history. So the way we have, we are looking at it. At least uh, there has to be a couple of use cases, right? Uh, instead of just having it being a research uh, or a talking point. Uh, the way we are looking at it, central to any kind of behavioral change, I mean, it's public, right? HTTP and everybody, we don't know who is on the other side. So central to any kind of behavioral change is an identity, okay? The identity that we are transacting with at this point of time, right? And as a protection layer, we don't try to get into the business logic. We just see everything, HTTP, HTTPS traffic. And one set of identities that we automatically have is uh, IP address, right? But we can also get a lot of other identities. The moment there is a trigger point to know more. And one example that I gave was the client, client side validation bypass. Client side validation bypass in isolation does not look like a big vulnerability uh, or a big risk. Yeah, fine, he bypassed JavaScript and did an attack. But if you look at it in the context that the person who is doing the bypass, that means I know for a fact that guarantees that the person on the other side is not a normal user. So from that standpoint, the entire standard set of rules has to change his behavior. So in this case, what can happen? Right? In this case, in that session, what are all the identities that we can give? If, if, if we can get session IDs, so the user IDs, uh, if those things are not available, we can get device fingerprinting. And for that particular set of combinations of ID, IP and thing, we can have a more aggressive, what would otherwise be a log rule. Like an example, I'll give you a, for the sake of example, single quote. Is one of the, I mean, I just block single quotes. I can block SQL injections, right? But I cannot block single quote without risking false positive. But maybe in this situation, I can translate that particular rule which would otherwise be in a log mode into a block mode because I know for this particular session the person on the other side is an attacker and what would otherwise be a suspicious rule. I don't have to worry about false positives because to hell with this person, I know for a fact it's an attacker, I don't care about false positives and put them into block. And that's sort of the concept which you call anomaly scoring and self-learning and changing of logic of rule that we have in place. Right? When these things are a combination of once we learn from automated monitoring, we update the rules based on the learning to have the policy itself self heal based on this. Right. Another example is, uh, I can give you another example, which is uh, application DDoS. I mean, one of the best, uh, one of the difference which is in monitoring is the rate control. Right. I can have a rate if I get X number of requests in one second from a single identity, and the identity for the argument sake, let me say, is IP. Then I, right, now I cannot just block them. What do I do if it is suspicious? Now, if I block them, there is a possibility of false positive. Because Shopper Stop has a Diwali sale, and what would be 100 requests per second is uh, suspicious on uh, spring will be normal on Diwali, doing the same, right? I cannot just have a cookie cutter rule. But what I can do is I can have something that beyond a certain threshold is suspicious. Instead of blocking them, we can put a captcha. Now, in captcha, we just don't stop there. We, can, we don't just put a captcha and stop there, right? We can have a captcha, and the captcha page itself can have intelligence getting the device fingerprint through JavaScript screen resolutions, 
and the captcha page itself fails more than three times in one second most guaranteed it's a bot because captcha is also a form and if it's a bot that is doing the attack on the other side it is going to fail it three times in one minute, uh, one second and that will trigger that now any subsequent request from this device id which i know for a fact because the captcha page is my page can trigger the rules to say that what is otherwise uh, blog rules would now become block rules if this device id cookie exists in the request right so and, and then and then machine learning aws themselves as a machine learning api uh, you have good data and bad data and you have data models in place uh, a lot of the self healing especially for monitoring and triggers to look at things can become much more comprehensive sophisticated and simple for the customer even though the back end becomes sophisticated Uh, Nikhil, that's it. I think uh, okay. it's a vast topic. I hope. Yeah. 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 Uh, thanks. Thanks, Vicky, on that uh, too. So I also have, uh, you know, there are a lot of questions pouring in, and uh, we have very limited time here. So I'm just going to take one last question, and uh, you know, and we will surely get back with all your answers to your uh, questions. Uh, you know, post this webinar over an email. Uh, and you know, over uh, maybe a personal call as well, and you know, answer most of your questions. But one last question that I would like to uh, ask Gopa is from one of the attendees: is uh, have any specific rules been configured uh, for WAP? Uh, you know, from a very retailer perspective, maybe some of your observations that you know you can share on this uh, public with the attendees. Um. Come across very retail specific rules, but uh, yes, uh, no, from an online commerce perspective, yes, there were cases. Uh, something like uh, what I mentioned is about bots. You know, we see a lot of uh, traffic coming from bots who uh, try to consume a lot of resources on their infrastructure. So, uh, we one is that, and second is that other instances of uh, when you release frequently, you will come across uh, many instances of vulnerabilities which will take time to fix. And we have an approach of uh, scattered development where we have internal, external, multiple parties involved and then code compilations and uh, release. So when it happens is there are a lot of uh, instances of uh, uh, stand different standards and coding coming into picture and merging it. In a short period of time, you uh, have to compile the code, uh, go through the reviews, and then push it. So in such cases, you know, at times there are cases of uh, blocking things uh, quickly uh, or creating a mitigation approach uh, rather than fixing it and then going live. Um, some cases, not all the time, happens. So those things are done. Uh, also, uh, other thing is that when you are uh, when you do regular uh, vulnerability assessment, you know, it, and you are able to input those uh, specific issues into the WAF and create rules. Per se, online has a, its own a different set of issues. So those things are very well addressed in this approach. Uh, some of the other things could be that you know you want to expose your internal APIs uh, to cloud. Um, so those kind of uh, things you are can do whitelisting. Uh, you can say that okay, uh, create a rule say that traffic between these two sites are allowed or these two IPs are allowed towards this API. Uh, those things are possible, and that's what we have done. Okay. Okay. Uh, th thanks, Gopa. Uh, I think we are almost uh, running out of time, so I want to uh, thank all the audience for all your questions. Uh, once again, if we missed, uh, you know, answering any of your questions, we will make sure to reach out to you. You all uh, post this webinar with, uh, you know, with your inquiries, with your answers, and uh, and we are sure that you know our uh, team uh, here will be always ready to help you with all the insightful knowledge that you would require. Uh, so we would also, you know, we will, you know, we also encourage you all, you know, to take a 14-day free trial. Uh, of our task solution, you know, for this you can reach out, uh, you know, to us at sales at industries.com, or you can also visit, uh, you know, our uh, website, which is uh, www.industries.com, and uh, you know, uh, our sales guys or any of us would be more than helpful to uh, 
uh, you know, give you all a trial of the entire solution and offering and, uh, you know, help you all get a hands-on experience on the solution. Uh, so yeah, we also have a, you know, a quick, uh, you know, we also set up a quick poll uh, which would throw up now. So I would encourage all the audience, you know, you can give us your valuable feedback on this webinar. You know, the poll lasts for, uh, you know, less than 10 seconds, so it starts now. So thank you, Venki, uh, Gopa, and Shantanu for your valuable insights uh, and the audience for taking your precious time to be part of this webinar. So see you all. Take care and uh, have a great uh, week ahead. Uh, thank you.